Hello, it's Dr. Rafael Gutierrez. Today I'm going to talk about the elementary chemistry needed to understand biology. Now, I am starting with the periodic table, and I just want to tell you some things about it before we go deeper into it and we deal with a lot of the elements in here. here. And one of the first things I would actually tell you to do is, if you do have a periodic table, and you can see that I took mine from the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, you can make a line pretty much coming along this side here and down. And any of the elements on this side will have negative charges. Carbon is an odd one because it can have sometimes a positive, a negative, or usually a lot, mostly it's going to be neutral. And you can actually use the negatives here as four, three, two, and negative one on this column. Now, these are your noble gases, and they will not have any charge. So over here, you can actually have a positive, a negative four, a negative three in here, negative two, negative one. And those negative charges tell you that it has an extra electron. I will talk more about it. Now, as you come over here, this column will usually have a positive one, the column over here will have a positive two and the ones here vary. So for instance, uh, iron, you can have a positive one or a positive two. Uh, zinc can have different amounts of positives, uh, but those we'll talk about a little later. To understand why, it, you really have to look at the outer electron shell, which I will talk about a little bit later. But for now, I want to review what an atom is. And an atom is pretty much the basic unit of matter. It's made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. The center of the atom is called the nucleus. And so remember that an atom is a basic unit of matter and you have a nucleus. And the nucleus is made of the protons and neutrons. Interesting thing is you do have different types of the same element, which will vary based on how many neutrons they have. And so it will be heavier and these atoms will be called isotopes. Now, one thing that, that I'm gonna draw is how you have electrons on the outside of, outside of the nucleus and they're circulating around. A lot of times they cannot jump and move around. And as they're on the outside, the electrons can sometimes be lost. And if you lose an electron as it's a negative charged, as it's negatively charged, if you lose an electron, you pretty much gain a positive charge. If you add an electron, you gain a negative charge. Remember, electrons are negative, so they're going to give you the charge. Now, the simplest of the atoms is hydrogen. In the most basic, the nucleus will have a positive charge molecule called a proton. And sometimes it will not have a neutron, but if it does, the neutron will also be here in the nucleus. And both of these have mass. And we measure the mass in an atomic mass, which I'll show you later. Now, outside the nucleus, again, remember the nucleus is where the proton and neutron are squeezed together. You have an electron. I'll put it as E and we'll say, put a negative here. And the electron is kind of wandering around here in what's called the uh, electron cloud. And there's different levels of clouds, which we call them uh, shells. Now, I wanted you to see the I wanted to talk about the atomic mass versus the atomic number. Atomic mass is how much something weighs in atomic mass units or Daltons. And these are units of measurements for the mass of an atom. It is not in, done in grams because they are too small to actually weigh in grams. And so if we look at this, a proton will have a mass of one atomic unit or Dalton. The neutrons will have one atomic Unit and neglectable in bio and uh, I'm sorry, electrons in biology are neglectable. And so when we have a neutron atom, you will actually calculate the mass by the amount of protons and neutrons it has. The electron you pretty much ignore for the most part. The atomic num the atomic uh, number actually tells you just how many protons there are. So all atoms of a certain type are going to have the same amount of protons. 
but they can vary in neutrons. For instance, in hydrogen, you can end up getting different neutrons and different isotopes of hydrogen. Atomic number and mass is seen on the periodic table, and it's really actually uh, interesting to see. So for instance, if we take hydrogen, what you'll see is you'll see a number up here on hydrogen, usually it's one, and that tells you the atomic number. Underneath it, you'll have a one point something, or just a one, and that's the atomic mass. What this is telling you is for most part, hydrogen will have one proton, and that's it, so it'll have a mass of one. If you have a hydrogen with a two, it would tell you you have one proton and one neutron. And so here you can actually see the atomic mass. And if you look at some of the things here, like hydrogen, you have one and one. If you go to carbon, you have six and 12, which tells you you have six neutrons in it. And so one of the things you'll notice is the atomic, the periodic table will tell you a lot about what you're actually looking for. Now, one of the things I will mention is when you're mixing atoms together, usually we talk about how many moles are in a uh, mixture. Now, what we usually what we'll do is we'll take the uh, molar mass, and the molar mass is calculated as kilograms per mole. You can, while you're calculating at times, use grams per mole, but remember that you didn't use kilograms per mole. Just a slight variation. And so you're going to have to adapt. Now, pretty much what it is, is you take the uh, kilogram and use uh, Avogadro's number. Avogadro's number is how many atoms are in a, uh, pretty much are in a gram of, uh, how many atoms are in a gram of a, any particular molecule? So if we take hydrogen, you'll notice I'm using hydrogen. It has a mass of one, and hydrogen gas is actually H2, so it has two hydrogens. So the molar mass would be two kilograms per mole. Now, you also have molality. Molality is how many moles per liter. So if mol one of the things that can happen is you can't actually calculate the moles based on grams, and so you just change the liter to milliliter. So you actually bring it down to a thousand. And so you would pretty much, instead of having a thousand grams here, uh, one kilogram, you would have one gram per milliliter. Remember a, li a milliliter is one thousandths of a liter. Now, most basic atom, like I've mentioned, is the hydrogen. And you can see why this is important and that I'm actually repeating it. You have one proton, uh, one, not one, one electron, you have one electron and variations of neutron. The atomic number is one and it can lose electrons. And if it loses an electron, it ends up becoming a positive ion called a cation. Now, you do also have other chemical uh, elements that are important to know. One of them is an oxygen. Like I said, the oxygen atom usually has, well, the oxygen atom has eight protons and around eight neutrons. You can have different isotopes, which will have different numbers, but for the most part, it would be eight and eight. And so if you have eight protons and eight neutrons, what you have is an atomic mass of 16. Uh, sometimes, well, when oxygen is bound to another oxygen, usually they share electrons. The outer shell, like I said, you can end up getting uh, losing two electrons, but when you, what ends up happening is when they, uh, I'm sorry, they usually can uh, gain electrons. They usually have two extra ones and they can pull in two. And when they're unpaired, when oxygen is unpaired, it usually will have a neg negative two charge. The molar mass is 16 grams because as you can see here, is the uh, eight plus eight, 16. And so 16 grams per mole is, is what the molar mass would end up being. If we use water uh, to show you how these things work, we can actually see that oxygen binds to hydrogen. So when we're looking at water, we find the molar mass of 
hydrogen being hydrogen being 2 and oxygen being 16. So we have 18 grams per mole in that case. Again, it can have a negative 2 charge. If you look here, if you remember, you can have a, on carbon, you can have a negative 4, negative 3, oxygen number negative 2, and this column uh, negative 1. So you can see how the periodic table will help you out. You can also see the number and the mass. Carbon is another very important atom that we have to deal with, namely because the chemistry that we use for life is usually called organic chemistry. And organic chemistry is looking at carbon and how it ends up uh, working with other things to make organic molecules. We can see that it has a molecular number of six and a molecular weight of 12, which means you have six neutrons, so you can actually have the right weight. And one of the things is when, it, when carbon is mixed with oxygen to form carbon dioxide, we can actually see how these things come together. So over here I put, if carbon is 12 you know, grams per mole and oxygen has a molar mass of 16, carbon dioxide would have 44 grams per mole because it's one carbon and two oxygens, you add them together. We also have methane. Methane is carbon with four hydrogens. What you're seeing is carbon can bind to four different things, oxygen usually two. And so what ends up happening is over here, again, we have a molecular weight of 12. And so methane, as you have four hydrogen, methane would, act, would end up giving you a, not 14, it would be four plus 12 would be 16. I did an error here. This would be a six. It also, again, it shows you that the carbonate can form four bonds with different things. Again, if you remember, carbon can be a plus or a minus four, and so you can have different binding with different atoms. Now, we're talking about putting things together, and one of the important things that, one of the things that's important to talk about when we're doing this is when we're missing chemicals, what we're doing is we're making a solution. What a solution is, is it's, what's, it's something that dissolves in something called a solvent. What is dissolved is called a solute. What, gets dis, what is dissolved is a solute. What is doing the dissolving is a solvent. And so a solution is a solvent and a solute. And so if we look at something like seawater, seawater, we're just gonna do the sodium chloride, which we can see is Na sodium. Uh, Cl for chloride, sodium will have a positive charge normally, and chloride will tend to have a negative charge. And so when we put these in the water, they will actually mix, they will actually will break apart. And so again, water is a solvent, sodium chloride is a solute. This is, gets broken down in water, and together it's a solution. Another important concept that we actually have to look at in chemistry, which I've talked about previously, is diffusion. And this is very important to understand life and a lot of chemical reactions that occur. And in short, what diffusion is, is you have these vibrations and molecules. And as you have vibrations and you have molecules colliding, they tend to go from an area of high concentration to low. Easiest way to actually look at this is if you think of your favorite fo food, if you have a burger and the molecules in the burger are vibrating, they're gonna go from a high concentration of the burger and spread to lower concentration, the air around. And so when you walk into the room and someone's eating burgers, you'll smell burgers. If you're working at a coffee shop, you've seen this. You walk into a coffee shop and you have a area of low concentration of coffee, the air, and as you get closer and closer to where the coffee is being made, the smell gets stronger because it goes from the high concentration where the coffee is actually being made to the rest of the room. Now, one thing to remember is that while this occurs passively, you're adding, if you add heat, it will increase the rate of diffusion. And with that, we can all now talk about chemical bonds. Now, chemical bonds come from, ver have various strengths. 
and occur because of how the electron shells, electrons are on the outer shell. The outermost shell is not full of, uh, if the outer electron shell is not full of, not atoms, but electrons, this should be electrons, it's not stable. The strongest type of bonds actually happens uh, when electrons are, are evenly shared and you can't really tear it apart under uh, non, pretty, pretty much under normal uh, conditions. That you, what ends up happening is these things are held together tightly because they uh, share the electrons completely perfect. And so to break it, you actually need to have a chemical, a break. So if we take glucose, which is our basic sugar, we see that the bonds are strong enough that when you put them in water, they remain tight. These are covalent bonds, and to, when you break these bonds, you end up getting energy. Now, if you try to make these bonds, you have to put energy together. Now, over here, I have an equation that's from uh, how we use carbon in, in the planet. Now, if you look here, you have, I didn't even it out, which I will tell you how to do it here, but what you have is you have carbon dioxide and water with energy. As you have carbon dioxide, water, and energy, you can build bonds. So over here, you end up making a sugar molecule. Now, one thing about this is if you look at carbon dioxide, CO2, it tells you that you have one carbon per, and in the hydrogen area of carbon, uh, I'm sorry, the oxygen level of carbon dioxide, you have two oxygen. The way it works is over here, this tells you that you have an oxygen and the two tells you that you have two. Now in the carbon, you don't have to put the one because it's assumed if you put a carbon, you have a one. If you look here, the hydrogen, you have two, oxygen, you have one. And so you would actually write that out on the other equation. Now, over here, you have sugar, which is something called a hydrocarbon. Uh, actually a uh, carbohydrate. And so what you have is, if you look here, you have 12 hydrogens for every six oxygen here. And so what would end up happening is, if you think about this, what you have is you have six waters technically here. So on the other side of this, where you have H2Os, as you have six waters, it would be six h 2 O, and so the hydrogen and oxygen here look like they are balanced. Now, if you look here, we have instead of one carbon, we have six. So this carbon dioxide would have to give us, we would have to have six carbon dioxides to be able to make the sugar molecule. And so we are having some, six small part things coming together with energy to pretty much form a larger molecule. And, and so to make these covalent bonds, you have to put a lot of energy in to bind it. Now, if you notice, with this equation, oxygens, we have six here and 12 here. We already have here six, and over here we have O2, so we have uh, two times whatever oxygen, and so over here we'd have another six oxygen. Now. The reason this is important is if you think of what plants do and some bacteria, they'll take carbon dioxide and water and through photosynthesis, make sugars and release oxygen, thus removing carbon dioxide from the air. Us humans will take the sugar and we'll take oxygen from the air we breathe and we'll break it down. And what we end up getting is as we're breaking big bonds and getting smaller bonds, smaller as we're getting these big structures and breaking it to smaller, what we end up is releasing energy that we can use for other things. Now, we also have ionic bonds. Ionic bonds are bonds where electrons are not evenly shared, so one atom tends to hold the electrons more than the other. This is seen in sodium chloride, where if you put it in water, it's kind of neat what happens. The sodium and chloride disassociate and end up giving you a sodium anion, I'm sorry, a sodium Ion, in this case, as you have a positive, it's a cation and a chloride ion, which would be an anion, and water. And as this happens, you end up having 
elect you have a electrical aspects in it and so a lot of times these are called electrolytes now a lot of times people will tell you oh something's good for you because it has an electro electrolytes all they're telling you is we have salt water that we're selling you at a higher price than we should remember an ion is a charged particle and they can be either positive ions which are cations or anions which are negative ions I want you to come back here and look at sodium and chloride. Again, if you look at, remember this column here, when not paired with anything, tends to have a positive one. The sodium will have a positive one. The chloride, which is over here, is in the column that would give you a negative one. And so that's why you have sodium chloride, both of them have a charge, have a charge when they dissociate in water. Now the other bonds that we have are hydrogen bonds. And these are the weak weak bonds but there's a lot of them what ends up happening is if you think of a hydrogen being a positive and negative when it's bound to another atom the hydrogen tends to maintain a partially positive charge what i mean is the negative the electron will tend to associate more with whatever the hydrogen is bound to as that happens hydrogen ends up having a partial positive charge so negative charges and partial negatives will be attracted to it. Uh, if we think of uh, water in a little more general, we have oxygen bound to two hydrogen. And usually what you would see is the oxygen molecule up here. And you would have hydrogens coming off the, the sides here. So you'd have a hydrogen here. And on the other side, you'd have another hydrogen here. As the electrons will end up binding cl more closely to oxygen, remember, oxygen ha can have a, part, a uh, slight negative charge, can actually take hydrogens, but giving you a uh, minus two, you end up having a slightly, a partial positive charge here. As you have a partial positive charge on one side and a partial negative charge on the other, we call this a polar molecule. And it's, so it's going to have charges here. As we have that, when you arrange water, the partial negative will, buy, will be attracted to the partial positive and the partial positive to the negative. And so you'll end up getting this structure that can pull on each other. That's why if you take water, it, uh, you take water and it falls, it tends to clump up, making beads of water. It gives you surface tension because of these partial and positive and negative charges. Water is a very special substance, and it's not, it doesn't just do it to oxygen. You can do it with a lot of other, uh, other uh, molecules that have a partial positive and negative charge. Now, in pure water, hydrogens tend to jump. So if you have a oxygen here, hydrogen and hydrogen, and you have another oxygen here, the hydrogen here can bind to this one, and the hydrogen from below can bind to this side here so the hydrogen is constantly being broken down and building up to other uh, water molecules and this is actually important because it makes water act as a bit of a buffer and which i'll talk about in a few more slides now the chemistry of water is vital for understanding because it allows for life to be possible due to it, all the properties for instance one of the neat things about water is when it freezes it's less dense than when it's liquid. So what happens is let, if we have water and it gets colder and colder, it actually becomes more and more dense, which sinks. As it starts to freeze, the water, the ice actually has less density. And so it actually floats back up. And that's why ice floats. And you can have an area where you have different temperatures of water based on how cold the, how cold the, uh, everything else is the other interesting thing about water it it ends up to it does act to take heat out, out of an environment when the environment is hotter than the water temperature and it gives off heat when the environment is cooler than the water temperature this is why if you go to a area that has a beach the temperature tends to be a bit more temperate than if you're inland if you are by the beach usually the cold the extremes of cold and heat don't tend to be as severe as if you're inland away from water because of 
those effects of water. It does have other issues too. For instance, one of the things we find is as water warms, it does give more energy. So as we're seeing hurricanes, you'll notice that hurricanes tend to heat, hit places with warmer water because they, the hurricanes can actually end up getting more energy from it. As it actually goes to cooler waters, the energy pulls out. So if water temperatures rise, one of the predictions is that we will start seeing more and stronger hurricanes and we'll see them in place. If water continues to heat, we will start seeing hurricanes in places that we normally wouldn't expect to see them, such as California. Uh, there's another, a couple other things about water and that's whenever it changes phases, energy has to be added. So if we're going from, if we have ice and it melts, it tends to pull energy away from the outside environment. If you're evaporating water, it takes energy away from the environment. If you think about it, when you sweat, your skin gets covered with water and as water evaporates, it cools you down. Now, when, again, I mentioned this earlier, but the way water is, it can give a hydrogen ion or accept a hydrogen ion. Uh, and so it can act as something called an acid and a base. And so here, I, here I'm going to talk about acids, base, pH, and buffers. Don't panic. If you look at this, an acid, in short, the simplest thing is something that gives you a hydrogen ion. So if something can give you a hydrogen ion, it's an acid. If you notice, most acids have hydro in it. So uh, hydrochloric acid will be a acid made of hydrogen and chloride. Base tends to accept a hydrogen ion. And a lot of these will have hydroxide groups. Uh, or, and so a sodium hydroxide will actually, can actually take in a hydrogen ion. And when it does that, it ends up forming water. And so these two play along together. New what a neutral solution is, remember a solution is a mixture where you have a solute and a solvent. A neutral solution is where you have an acid and base which are equal in levels and you're not getting more hydrogens, not getting less hydrogens, they're even. And then you have pH. pH is a measure of hydrogen. Technically it stands for P is for potential, H is hydrogen. So it's looking at how many hydrogens something can give. And if you can donate hydrogens, your pH actually becomes less because it's the way we actually look at the formula for our pH, it's based on a negative log, a log negative 10. And so as something gets more acidic, it become, has a lower pH. If something's higher acidic, sorry about that. If something is more acidic, it has a lower pH. It has more hydrogens, but lower pH. If you have a basic solution, you have less hydrogens and higher pH. So a neutral pH, by the way, something like pure water would have a pH of seven. If it's below seven, it's considered an acid. If it's above seven, it's considered a base. Now I do wanna show you some examples of acids. And one of the ones that I've mentioned in a few times before is carbonic acid. If we look at this, carbonic acid is made up of a hydrogen, a carbon, and three oxygens. And when it's in solution, the hydrogen will come off and give you hydrogen, which would be a plus, and bicarb this actually right here would be bicarbonate. And what ends up happening, this would have a negative charge. And so the hydrogen comes off to pretty much act as an acid. I mentioned hydrochloric acid. You have hydrogen, one hydrogen, one chloride, and the hydrogen and chloride will disassociate, so the hydrogen will bind to something else. Examples of bases are bicarbonate, baking soda, that you probably have in your refrigerator. And over here you can see the bicarbonate, and if there's excess hydrogens, they will bind and give you, you'll notice, carbonic acid. Oh, and I'll actually talk a little bit more about this later. You also have something like sodium hydroxide. 
you have sodium and a oxygen and a hydrogen. And if there's extra hydrogen, it binds and gives you water and sodium. And so these are actually the base, best examples of acids and bases. Now, the last thing I want to talk to you about before we go into the organic chemistry, which we'll start um, in the next uh, the next lecture is buffer solutions. A buffer solution is pretty much a solution that maintains its pH. Now, the one I'm going to give you is one that is used in the body. The, you have a buffer solution where you have carbonic acid and bicarbonate. And these helps maintain a stable pH. If you think about it, this hydrogen can come off and bind to the bicarbonate, converting the bicarbonate to carbonic acid, and the carbonic acid here will become bicarbonate. You just switch the hydrogen, so you have the same things in the, inside. If you were to have a solution of this, and you pour something that has some more acid, the base will neutralize the acid. If you put something that, ha and so the pH won't change much. If you put something in there, which is basic, the acid will neutralize the base, and so you won't get the, these major changes. Now I'm going to put some stuff together so you can see it. I've mentioned this before, C6H12O6. Six carbon, 12 hydrogen, six oxygen, and O2. I didn't actually uh, make the equation perfect because you're going to end up needing oxygen to break this apart, but when you break sugar, you end up getting carbon dioxide and water. As you break carbon dioxide and water, these will bind together, giving you two hydrogen, two, one carbon, one carbon, and three oxygen. This again is your bicarbon, uh, your carbonic acid. Now carbonic acid will, will disassociate to give you bicarbonate and hydrogen. And in the human body, the hydrogen will bind to intracellular proteins. I want you to remember, intra means inside. Cellular is the cell, Pro so there are proteins inside the cell. And as hydrogen binds inside the cell, the bicarbonate is released. And so what you end up having in blood is a bicarbonate that came from the cells. The hydrogen stays in the cells. And you can see here you have the carbonic acid. So in your body you have this buffer, the carbonic buffer, which tries to keep your blood at a certain pH. The reason is if your pH changes, you can end up dying. And so this is actually really important for that. There is another thing you can actually see with all this. And that is when we talked about evolution, we talked about how initially geologists have told us that the normal environment had a high level of carbon dioxide and methane. Besides being greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, when mixed with water, will give you carbonic acid. And so the water that we find in this primitive earth will actually have higher levels of acid, giving you an acidic environment in the water. So it makes it so certain things can't live. This also gives us another thing. If we have a higher levels of carbon dioxide and water, we have more carbonic acid, which means we have more damage in modern society to infrastructures because carbonic acid can react to certain rocks, certain uh, structures, helping dissolve them easier. Well, I hope you enjoyed this and have a nice day.